everyone, and thank you for joining for the third CyberForce webinar in our series here for 2021. I'm Amanda Joyce. I'm the Cybersecurity Program Lead here at Argonne National Laboratory. I wanted to remind everyone that this webinar is being recorded, so sticking online here, you're agreeing to being recorded. Um, without further ado, I wanted to welcome today Kate Marks, who's the Deputy Assistant Secretary from the Office of Cybersecurity, Energy Security, and Emergency Response to say a couple words. Kate? Great, thanks Amanda so much. So thank you all for joining us here today. The topic of today's CyberForce webinar is industrial control systems. And this is really a timely uh, topic because it's something that we've been thinking about a lot recently in the CSER office. Defending ICS environments are really critical to protecting our national security. These systems, you know, they manage, they automate, they measure, and they regulate many of the physical processes that are linked with our energy system. And any compromise of those systems could really cause devastating human or economic harm to the American people. And this is really especially true when we're talking about the energy sector, because nearly every other critical energy, or sorry, critical infrastructure relies on power and fuel to operate. We know that the cyber threat to ICS has been well documented. The investment by government and the private sector in ICS and OT cybersecurity has really trailed enterprise IT cybersecurity. The cyber threats to ICS and operational technology networks are becoming more sophisticated, they're becoming bolder, and as our infrastructure is becoming more interconnected at an increasing pace, we're really seeing a larger threat there. So during the webinar today, you're going to hear about how ICS weren't really originally designed to defend against malicious cyber attack. And as technology continues to advance and IT and OT systems converge, ICS are really in a generational flux. That's really because of the energy sector's historical reliance on manual controls, as well as the recent drive to adopt new technologies for those systems. So that's why the DOE give you a little bit of insight here on what we are doing, has partnered with the Department of Homeland Security and several electric utilities across the country in an ambitious 100-day plan. This plan kicked off in April, and it's a voluntary effort that's going to help us deploy sensors and other technologies that will really help to increase the visibility of threats within ICS and OT systems, as well as improve indicators, detections, warnings, and response capabilities. And this is really essential. We want to make sure that we're investing in programs and solutions that can proactively help to secure our ICS networks and in turn protect critical infrastructure on the energy sector. So that's why we're here today. We're really hoping that you all can join us as part of the next generation of cyber defenders to really help safeguard our nation's critical energy infrastructure. So I want to emphasize you know, we're really glad that you could be here today uh, to learn more about ICS, a little bit more about, you know, what's going on in that space. And we're really looking forward to hearing from our partners at the Argonne National Lab and Intelligenesis on the webinar. So with that, thank you so much. And I'll pass it over to Stephen Day. Stephen. Uh, thank you very much, Kate. Uh, so today, um, first off, hello, my name is Stephen Day. Um, I'm currently a cybersecurity uh, analyst at Argonne National Laboratory. Uh, one of my main focus areas is the emulation simulation for both the cyber physical and virtualization of industrial control systems for various critical infrastructure. Uh, the CyberForce competition not only helps students understand basic cybersecurity concepts, but also leans into the operational technology space of industrial control systems. Uh, over the past uh, five iterations of the CyberForce competition, we have collaborated with Matthew Llewellyn of CyBodyWorks Intelligenesis uh, to create cyber physical system models uh, to be used within these uh, competitions. Scenarios have ranged from water transportation, natural gas extraction, uh, solar energy generation, substation power grid, data center, and manufacturing. Uh, this meant that each team would get a physical device model on their tables to help actually connect up to the cyber physical systems and their potential implications. Uh, due to the pandemic, uh, we had to rework our physical model approach to the cyber physical uh, environments and systems and develop a completely virtual ICS uh, for the competition that could provide more scalability. 
Uh, last year's prototype virtual ICS revolved around sustainable energy generation in the form of wind turbine farm. Uh, this year, we also plan to leverage another sustainable energy generation platform as well, uh, but more to come on that at a later date. Um, so today, uh, Matt from Intelligenesis Cybody Works is going to be demoing and showing us uh, what industrial control systems are, uh, how they function, and various things about them. So if you're interested in participating, uh, be sure to log in to Twitch. Otherwise, uh, watching will be just as informative. So over to you, Matt. All right, well, thank you very much for that awesome introduction and learning about you know, the cyber force competition, the criticality of industrial control systems, the 100 day plan, all of these elements are very important in trying to defend critical infrastructure and specifically cyber physical uh, systems. So we got something a little interesting for you uh, that you're gonna get a chance to actually interact uh, with some control system environments. Now, here we are, we're live on Twitch there's lots of things that, that you can do. A lot of times people are watching it for gaming and be able to follow along. Well, we've made things a little interesting where you can actually follow along with a Raspberry Pi, some of these cyber physical systems, and even interact with them through what we're calling mission cards. And so what we used to do back in the day when we could be in person on some of these things, uh, would we actually let you to physically interact with a Raspberry Pi and a control system to, to work with it. And then as Stephen was pointing out, you know, even the Cyberforce competition last year, we had to virtualize it. And we have you know, some different pieces of industrial control system components that I just wanna show you before we get into those model environments you're gonna be stepping through. One of those things here is just a, a sensor. This is actually a, a high pressure sensor that you might have in a, a pipeline operation or an oil or gas operation to be able to sense an environment. And that's when we start thinking about a control system space, we have to think through it from sensing, sensing some kind of in the environment, and then outputs that we're then controlling. And then the logic that connects those two. Now, another thing that, uh, to go back to a model that we built out that Stephen had talked about was this was one of the models we had at actually one of those competitions. Uh, this is a uh, solar generation model. We had our linear actuator operating the solar panel. We had a Raspberry Pi that was sensing uh, the current state of this environment and then changing it based upon time. And then these are a series of relays that actually control it. Well, what's really pretty awesome is you can actually build out even at your house, some of these models that you can use to start understanding how these cyber physical systems operate. But they're not going to be perfect. I mean, these systems are quite robust and you can very easily, I mean, that's the challenge of trying to model these cyber physical systems is they may be a billion dollars, right? From a power plant to a freshwater wastewater system in your community that's providing that supply of fresh water and taking away uh, that waste that's there. But the best thing you can do is try to use some of these single board computers to do that modeling. And so the environment that we have running here, I wanna show a quick view of the physical layout that you'll be working with using software-defined networking. So that physical layout that we have has several Raspberry Pis available on the uh, your left-hand side. Again, these are all virtualized. When we get into the environment you'll be working with on Twitch, uh, they're all virtualized in a way running on one Raspberry Pi, but what we're showing here is we have eight single board computers on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, some traffic infrastructure, that's what our mini kits are that are there on the left-hand side, looking at the traffic lights, and then a software-defined network. Here's a real network, but you're going to be using a software-defined network that will be uh, understanding and running through some different scenarios. The HMI that we're going to be having is here located again on your left hand side that's going to get again it's a dashboard of things that you'll be interacting with and again you're going to be working with this live stream on uh, the Savita or switch channels you also have some functional flow logic that will be configured that you'll be going through on those mission cards the software defined network is used using the naval research laboratory core software for us to be able to have a network between the client and the servers and then we have an emulated sense hat, that's what this is showing here, an emulated sense hat that gives us different sensors that we can interact with our outputs and our architecture. For more information about this specific environment, 
you can take a look at the twitch.tv slash cybotyworks underscore pods channel. So let me go ahead and put that into the chat dialog just so you can see what's available to you at that channel. Give me just one moment here. So twitch.tv slash cybotyworks underscore pods. And you don't have to go straight there now, but you can go there later on and it talks about in more detail the network of things uh, and systems and protocols you're gonna have the opportunity to interact with. And even if you're watching this recorded, you're gonna be able to jump into those streams and take a look. Now, I wanna go ahead and I'm going to again stream over one of our current Twitch channels Stay here with us now, but then we're going to dispatch you out to the individual pods for you to take a look. So I'm going to be hopping over to a Cybotyworks Pods uh, 1 location, twitch.tv slash Cybotyworks underscore pod 1. But we'll also have pod 2, pod 3, pod 4, pod 5, 6, 7, and 8. So let me go ahead and change my stream. And you can see here, this is an example of one of those Twitch channels we have up and running. Again, at that channel, I'm gonna be interacting with different mission cards that we'll be doing. So let me go ahead and I'm gonna drop myself out of this view just so you can see All right, so now that we're logging into this environment, you can see again that login, we're gonna start with that mission zero command. So let's go ahead and type in uh, mission zero. And we're gonna go ahead and click on the mission card that we have here. So this mission card talks about all the different missions that we have available for you to interact with. Now these missions uh, include just something in introducing the environment, mission card zero, as well as looking at simple communications control, thinking about local control with Boolean logic, learning about algorithms that are used for connecting our inputs to our outputs, as well as starting to understand state machines. Now, where do state machines actually matter? Well, another little piece of hardware that I have here, all right, this is an example of a uh, programmable logic controller, right? So in our example, we're actually using a Raspberry Pi as our logic controller. It's connecting our inputs to our outputs in our environment. So let's go ahead and zoom in. Uh, on the uh, mission card and remove the uh, the list of table of contents there on the left-hand side by hitting that hamburger in the upper left-hand corner. There we go. And so these are the individual missions that we have. And so I was commenting on earlier, it used to be we'd literally like give you these mission cards and we'd have you scan in an RFID tag. That's what's up here in this corner is an RFID tag and you could interact with the station. Well, now in this case, we're gonna have you interact with this station uh, remotely and we're going to step through a couple of missions ourselves with you before letting you go uh, and look at these stations that are going to be here. So let's take a look at these missions. Again, as I was saying, we have the simple communications and control, which just start with some really simple logic. And then we get into even doing man in the middle attacks against remote sensors. And then another mission station we have, which is just on Cybotyworks Pod 8. So it's a different Twitch channel, 
twitch.tv slash SaveIdaWorks underscore pod eight is where we explore interactions with external devices like a laser and what that can do to manipulate a sensor. So we're gonna go ahead and pick uh, using this mission station. So let's go back to the, uh, the mission station uh, Twitch channel. And let's go ahead and select um, mission one. We'll just start with the very beginning. All right, and what this is gonna do is load in that next mission. And again, we're gonna leave these pods up for you to interact with them later on. Let's open up mission card one. And I'm gonna physically pick up my mission card one here. Just so I can talk through it. Again, you have the opportunity to look at the Twitch channel. If you're there, you can actually download that same link. Um, or again, you can jump into another one of the Twitch SaveIdeaWorks pods to start following along there uh, at any time. So let's zoom in. And I'm gonna read through this and then we're gonna step through it. So during this mission, you'll explore how to sense and control physical components using node red. Now there's a question. And again, feel free to uh, use the comments field to chat with us. How many people have used node red before? Have you heard of node red? Did you even know it existed uh, as a functional flow logic connector, something you can use to connect IO as well as do some very easy Python programming um, without having to get into doing real Python coding. So we're going to use Node Red and learn what adversaries can see if you don't protect your communications. Again, this is really, really simple uh, beginnings to understanding cyber physical systems. This mission has helped you explore functional flow logic as well as technical eavesdropping. So one of the comments just came in, I haven't heard of Node Red. Well, here's the thing that's really cool. You can run Node Red on a Raspberry Pi, Node Red on an NVIDIA Jetson, Node Red on a Mac, Node Red on Windows, Node Red on any platform you really like. It runs on a lot of different hardware. Again, Linux, Mac, Windows, as you take a look at it. Uh, had a question come in. I will take a look at your question here in a moment um, after I go through this mission card. So step one says the mission locally controls the light tree LEDs and the Cybody Works printed circuit board. So what we have is we literally have a Raspberry Pi on the other side of this. It's located actually on the East Coast right now. And those Raspberry Pis that are on these Twitch channels are connected to the printed circuit board I showed earlier and little traffic lights. And you are going to be able to remotely interact with them as you go through these missions. The lights will turn on, the lights will turn off. You're going to see communication protocols going across the software-defined network. And truly, you're going to get cyber physical just through the Twitch chatbot command and control. And, and think, think of that command and control channel as just like an adversary might happen into an environment. They use chatbots. They use CNC channels. We're just going to use the Twitch chatbot as our CNC channel and think about somebody prepositioning into this control environment like we've done now, except that we've configured it in the way that we want it to operate. Uh, we're going to send a string hello world to the S1 control stations with simulated sense hats. And so what we have is we actually have, instead of having real sense hats, we have a simulated one, but everything else works the exact same way. And that's a node red node that allows for that simulation. The strings are sent to the local PCB general purpose input output pins, which are further attached to resistors and LEDs on those traffic light pie stops. The pod channel provides a view in a node red configuration and a camera view of the set battery works traffic light intersection. All right, you can read it. I don't need to read it. Let's do the step. So let's go back uh, to that Cybody Works pod one, and we're going to type in step one. So there you can see the logic that's running. We're going to send a true condition and a false condition. You're going to watch the mouse cursor go across. You're going to see it highlighted in yellow as we're going to open up and start exploring this environment and how it's configured. So we've taken over all the mouse and keyboard clicks for you to be able to understand how this thing's operating. And this is most likely how that administrator at Oldsmar Water Treatment Plant down in Florida, when we heard about it in the news earlier this year, would have felt. I mean, literally, somebody is taking and sending these mouse clicks and taking over their station. And so we just went and sent a true and false condition off to uh, the LEDs that are operating that traffic light intersection. Now, what does it look like? Well, on the right-hand side, now we're opening up the GPIO settings that are there. And I highly encourage you to get a Raspberry Pi, $35, right? Get the, you know, you can get these kits and you can start working and learning about how to construct cyber physical systems. And so here we've configured to work with G a GPIO pin and we've configured it as a digital output. That digital output is allowing us to turn things on and off in this environment. So 
And here again, if you look at the instructions, it says we're looking at and actually setting that true and false condition on GPIO 22 specifically. All right, so let's continue. Let's go back to uh, uh, the pod. And you can see in the bottom right hand corner, it says step one is complete. So there in the Twitch chat, step one's done. Now all of a sudden step one is complete. We can let lets us know we can continue to step two. Now, maybe again, you really want to get introduced in this environment and you wanna do these mouse clicks as you're going through it instead of what we're doing. Again, that's where you can get this software installed on your own computers. This is introductory concepts, again, in industrial control systems. So now the next step we're going to do is actually inject a string. So instead of it being a digital command, we're gonna do an analog command. Now, analog commands typically are not gonna be the words, hello world, unless we're actually pushing this out to let's say a control system associated with um, you know, a notification system on uh, an interstate. So where you get those message boards uh, that are there. But other analog devices that we'll have are controlling, let's say a linear actuator, controlling a conveyor belt where you may have a variable speed drive, some kind of setting where you're, you have a motor and certain RPM. So there's a lot of different analog devices that are beyond just an on and off condition where you have all the different variables. So let's go ahead and type in uh, step two. And so step two is gonna to go to the next level and inject the hello world string into this environment. Instead of turning on and off LEDs, we're actually gonna inject a string that's going to be displayed on that emulated sense hat. The emulated sense hat. Again, I was showing earlier a physical sense hat, which is again, it can add up, right? This is another $35 product as you get into it that you place on top of it, but it has the LED matrix that's on it, as well as an accelerometer, a gyroscope, a magnetometer, a humidity sensor, a pressure sensor, uh, a barometric pressure sensor, and then a temperature sensor all on it. And this was actually up as part of the Astro Pi initiative, even made at the International Space Station back in 2015. So here we are, we're showing our network connection. We're seeing what port that we're gonna be transmitting to. We see the remote IP address that we're connecting to. Again, this is all going across a software defined network. We're gonna see that network in just a moment in this display of what we're going and looking at this architecture. And so we're gonna inject the string and send it out to that dot .111 host on a port number, that 10,000 port number. And here's gonna be the receiving node red flow, the receiving side of this. So we're gonna receive that again on that 10,000 port and we're gonna send it out to that simulated sense hat, that string. And so here we're opening up uh, that specific uh, TCP node and then sending it out. We're gonna end up sending that out to that sense hat specifically where we're gonna be able to see that string. So give it just a moment here and it's gonna open it up. And then we'll be able to see that network flow and actually capture it using what's called a scapy module. We'll actually capture the network traffic going between the two. That's using Python and a scapy module. So there we did that injection of hello world. You can see that showing up on that simulated sense hat. We sent it across this software defined network. Again, I was talking earlier, if you look at that Cybodyworks underscore pods Twitch channel, after this is over, you can learn about that full network that we have set up that I was showing at the beginning of this session. And then we did that capture on that P3 hacker station. So again, what that was, was about 15 lines of code that's described in mission zero. We didn't cover mission zero directly, but in mission zero, it shows that Scapy module code. And what Scapy does is allows you to really do network protocol dissection. You can go and say, hey, I just care about what's inside the payload and that's it. And that's all in 15 lines of code. And, and in that mission zero card, which we encourage you to go and follow up on again after uh, we complete our one hour session now, go and run and look at mission zero. And you can look at the code details that are left behind there and how that P3 hacker station actually picked up that transmission. Now, the question is, why does that matter? Well, it matters in control signaling because now all of a sudden somebody now knows more about your operations. Now we're generally not sending a hello world string, we're sending data like barometric pressure data or humidity data or temperature data, or again, like I was saying before, a set point for a specific type of device. This mission only focused on something really simple, just looking at a data flow, but that's where you have to start. If you're gonna start learning these systems, you have to have building blocks, and that's how these mission cards are defined. So we're gonna go ahead and log out. Now, each one of these mission stations, just as you go and start taking this on on yourself to look at it, which I encourage you, if you're wanting to interact right now, go to twitch.tv slash underscore pod two, pod three, pod four, pod five. 
please stay out of pod one because I'm trying to use it at the moment. And pod eight, we're going to try to jump into it in a moment. But you can go and follow along if you want to, if you're getting you know, a little distracted or want to be distracted, or stay with us because we're going to demonstrate another mission. Uh, going through that building block scenario, we're going to go ahead now and move over to uh, mission three. Now, again, the way these stations are constructed, we get 20 minutes to do a mission. That's how we lock it down per person. And then we can log back in. And so we have to wait, though, it's saying here as a notice, we actually have to wait a minute before we can log back in. And so we can go ahead and do log in. Let's see if it, uh, it complains that we're trying to log in too fast uh, within our chat bot. Yeah, it says we, we got to wait a complete minute. So I really don't know how many seconds we have left before we're going to get there, uh, but that's what it's saying that we need to do. So let's go ahead and while we're waiting, uh, let's go and take a look at pod eight and then we'll come back and we'll do some encryption and some other data flow analysis that we can have in this, uh, in this environment. So what's unique about pod eight is I want to jump to this because I want to encourage you to not only think about defending cyber physical systems, but innovating with cyber physical systems. Uh, it's really phenomenal what's available at your fingertips now, as long as you understand what you can do with it. Uh, you know, we gave the example of the solar panel system that we designed. Stephen, at the very beginning, talked about all the other types of architectures that we modeled from the power grid to pipelines to manufacturing systems to high performance computing. We did all of that modeling using Raspberry Pis. And, you know, are they 100 percent accurate? No, but they can get they get you 80 percent of the way of accuracy of understanding more about how these environments function. And so this specific example, I'm going to change my uh, camera view here just for a moment. Uh, again, just to show this to you. This is Cybodyworks Pod 8 that we have right now. Oops, I need to. Yeah. Uh, this is Cybodyworks Pod 8. And what it is, is a microscope platform that has a Raspberry Pi on the top, a relay hat on the top that's controlling the on-off capabilities of a five milliwatt green, green laser pointer that's targeting a sense hat that's underneath here on this very bottom. And we'll see that in a moment as we look at the camera and a 300 times magnification lens that's associated with it. So this, the Raspberry Pi community came out in 2020 with the ability to do high definition lenses and allows you to even do expansion of different lenses. And so there's a pretty hefty about five inch lens on the bottom of it, maybe four inches, uh, that's doing that 300 time uh, magnification. So let me change my view again, and we will bring back in our shared screen. Okay, so now again says waiting for login. Again, we're at twitch.tv slash cybotyworks underscore pod eight. Pod eight. Now, this is the only one that allows us to run mission eight. So very important for you to understand mission eight only works here because it's the only system that's like it. So we're going to go ahead and do a login. And the reason I want to jump to this mission before going back to show you the emulated sense hat is because, again, this has a real sense hat you're going to be interacting with in this case. Uh, and it has sense data you can actually see being displayed on the dashboard. Our dashboards are HMI, our human to machine interface that we're interacting with. And so we can then go ahead and type in mission eight. Again, only mission eight works. It's just our construction of how we have this fire to build. But you can see on our display that data is actually being charted real time. And that's actually the real veterinary pressure here where we're at in our lab and the real temperature and the real uh, humidity that's being sensed uh, right now in this space. So it's going to go ahead and reset the environment. And let me bring up, uh, while we're doing that, go ahead and click on mission card eight. And the other thing I want to encourage you, and we can zoom in, is this actual mission and that physical environment was developed by a junior in high school, uh, actually my daughter, as you can see here, and it was part of a year-long program. And we interviewed her uh, as part of the RSA conference, uh, you know, and we asked her a couple questions. Well, one of those, how long did this take to do? Well, this was her entire uh, school year that she went through and went through some Cisco training, some networking training, some entrepreneurial training, and then worked in our lab on the cyber physical side to architect this control environment. 
this is all open to anybody to go and do these things. You have the toolkits, you have the ability, and especially now as you start going through these missions, you can start thinking about how, how cyber physical systems are constructed and then ultimately how to defend them. You know, as you start inventing and architecting your own, be thinking about, well, how would somebody compromise it? How would they break it? And then, of course, be trying to stop it, right? Don't allow it to happen. So this mission provides the exploration of physical sensor manipulation. Now, this is one that's a little interesting. So take a step back. The first thing is we have to understand how sense hats operate. They're there to be able to sense humidity, pressure, temperature, uh, and those things are called transducers. So transducers sense from the physical world some kind of an indication, so temperature, and then it has to convert that to electronic signaling, electrons. So those electrons are then flowing upon copper traces. Again, I encourage you, as long as you have approval, to take apart physical things. I, I like taking apart toys. I like, you know, all these things are cyber physical. Uh, to then see the printed circuit board that's underneath it. Now, if you're safe about it, you know, take a look at the HVAC unit in your home. Take a look at some of the control bars in, in a vehicle. Take a look at all the other cyber physical systems that are there, even like in a dishwasher or a washing machine if you're safe about it. You, know, you can always have to manage caution or be cautious of how much voltage and current, how many electrons are flowing through those environments like in our power grid. So here, those electrons, what we are believing is happening is we can actually cause electrons to jump off to get false indicators, false values using something called photons. And that even gets in the whole space of quantum computing and it's pretty amazing. I encourage you to take a look at it. Well, let's go back here. We're gonna jump out of it. We're gonna go back to step one. So step one, we're gonna take a look at this laser control system. And it's all built in node red. There's the logic. The logic is set up to be able to go in and change the camera and how it's operating, be able to do some control capabilities, as well as then turn on and off the laser to do this demonstration. So that's some of the logic that's there. So you can go ahead and do step one. And what step one does is it really demonstrates the capabilities of what node red can do. And again, I. I really encourage you to uh, to take a look as uh, you know as Princeton book made book made the con uh, the comment love a node red uh, and another good comment Unpl unplug them first <laughs> yes you know don't when we uh, we did a take apart session on a, uh, a high pressure cooker again all these different things unplug it first and unplug it for a period of time because there's something called a capacitor that you have to be uh, watching out for. So here again, we're opening up that taking a picture node and seeing some of the configurable options, the actual um, uh, width and height that is of the picture we're gonna take. If there's any type of modifications or adjustments we're gonna make to how the picture is being taken. And let me just turn back on a light uh, that turned off here because when we start taking our pictures. So we can then zoom in and we'll take a look at that uh, printed circuit board. All right, so step one's complete. Again, just showing you some of those capabilities of how you can take pictures. Let's go ahead and go to step two. What step two is going to do is actually go through the process of learning a little bit more about this chip. So when I think about securing cyber physical systems, I think from the chips up, to the comms in, from the sensor to the actuator, from the input to the output. And so what we just did is over here, I actually just heard a little click happen and a laser is shooting at that uh, barometric pressure sensor. It took a picture of, of that specific uh, printed circuit board and then uh, displayed it. My uh, light just turned off again. Let me go ahead and do that step again. And this is true, you can do the steps multiple times. So it's all designed that, you know, if you want to do that step again and just see how it works, uh, you can do that. So here we're going to do this step one more time just so we can get a better picture uh, that's coming out of it. All right. So we're going to get that picture to show up there. Give it just one moment. And again, you see, take a look at that barometric pressure dropping. Better memory pressure dropping, it went down to 840, 850, and then it jumps back up. And what that is, the difference between that laser being on and laser being off. And what is believed is what's something called the photoelectric effect is actually impacting that specific sensor. And so we have the, the mashup, right, is necessary in defending these systems of 
the biological engineer, the chemical engineer, the electrical engineer, the mechanical engineer, the IT cybersecurity professional, the hacker, the tinkerer, the reverse engineer, because there's so many things that couple this together uh, and get it to operate. I'm gonna have that step be operating. We'll go ahead and start that step one more time, please. I'm going to try one more time just to be able to see that picture because I wanted to show something that's not uh, that's not showing up yet. All right, well, I'm just going to discuss it. There is a little hole on the top of that chip that actually senses the environment. And it wasn't until putting this under a lens that I could actually see it, uh, that that was there. And that's what that laser is going through. All right, so let's get out of that. Uh, I want to go ahead and talk about another uh, mission. And now that we've seen, now that we've actually seen that sense had operating, so go ahead and log out of that station uh, and see some of that data flowing there and, and the outcome and looking at the HMI, I wanna actually see that data flow occurring uh, in, in another mission. And so let's go, to, um, let's go to mission four. And so to do that, we need to go back to our pod one station. So you have to remember pod eight, is only for mission eight, right? That's it. So let's go ahead and we'll log in now. We've, we've definitely gone beyond that minute, right? That, that challenge we had earlier of that first minute. As we're starting this up, I'm gonna go back to that earlier question there from uh, Princeton Brook. Matt, can you guys provide project boxes that we can receive that enable us to conduct on-site training with students and groups? How much would it cost to receive the layout that you display at the top? of your presentation. Uh, well, that's a good question. Feel free to contact us offline uh, on any of the interesting things about we might we might be able to do this type of model environment. So here we're gonna take a look at remote sensors with Wireshark. And another question I have for everybody, how many people, I'd asked earlier, who has heard of Node-RED? Well, now I have a question, who's heard of Wireshark? Hopefully I'm gonna get a flood of responses. I encourage you. I, I need to. I need some interaction here. So please comment inside the chat box so I can then see one if you know, one if you're listening. And again, um, I'm actually like a choose your own adventure you know, as we go through this. So you know, if there's certain things that you want me to cover, you can help guide what we discuss during this session. Because uh, I have lots of mission cards and lots of things I can demonstrate. I just need to know where there's some interest as we're going through it. All right. So one of the things about Wireshark. Um, is, you know, there's all these different ways we can dissect the sentence structure of ones and zeros, right? You know, I, if, uh, you know, when I post my resume, I actually say I know English and binary. So that, that's where I'm at in my categories. And I need binaries with, some, I need binary with some help. I probably need English with some help as well. But uh, the help that I get in understanding binary is a tool like a protocol dissector, right? So this protocol dissector is Wireshark. What Wireshark does is does the sentence framing of ones and zeros. You just look at it, you just have a sequence of ones and zeros that flew by literally at the speed of light. We need to be able to chop those up to understand what in the world they mean. And so what we've done here in our model for this specific mission, being mission four, uh, which we can go ahead and type in uh, mission four. In mission four, we take the data from the sense hat and the data uh, that we're sending from our control signaling station or actually our our HMI, and we just plop it right to the data payload. That's it. That's all we do is we we don't do anything else. We're putting it inside a Modbus or BACnet or S7 or Allen Bradley PCC, and those are a lot of great industrial protocols. But if you just begin with putting in the data payload, then you can put it in any other kind of protocol you want. And in fact, a lot of Node-RED modules allow you to use those protocols. Now, they may not be perfect protocols that match up exactly with what the vendor has deployed, but they're a great start and they work really well. Um, now, a question came in going back to the uh, uh, mission eight. What was the strength of that laser? That was a $10 uh, laser from Amazon, five milliwatt, uh, five milliwatt. Now I have some other lasers uh, that I played around with that, uh, in fact, it's not this camera, but I took one of them, I shot it into one of my cameras and it, it burned out, it burnt the pixels. 
Um, so there's all sorts of lasers that are out there. We have our laser cutting lasers, some etching lasers, burning lasers uh, that are a little bit more intense. But that was just a little five milliwatt green laser point. Uh, color matters. Uh, as you go through it, there's a little Roy G. Biv thing that happens. But nonetheless, um, that's what that was. All right. So now we, we did step one, right? In step one here, we have node red loading up. So you can then see our mission. So this one's going to be we're going to review the configuration of the HMI for the sensor data that we're receiving. So go ahead and type in step one once our mission is loaded. Again, look at the look in the chat bot there. It says mission four loading is complete. And that's when you know you can continue on. And in fact, if you try to do any of the other steps before the mission is completed loading, it won't let you do it. Um, um, we can just go ahead and leave the mission card closed uh, for now. But you feel free when you do it, you can go through the mission card. I'm just going to go ahead and describe it. So what we're going to do now in this first step is we're going to look at the architecture. We're going to look at that environment of that earlier request where it's all software defined you know, network that we've built. And this is all running on one Raspberry Pi, but we're using something called the Naval Research Laboratory core software to emulate our network and containerize our applications. Uh, like Docker containers, except, the, except instead of something called Linux containers, what we're using here. So we can see this connection. We see that remote IP address that we're connecting to, that dot 111, and the port number we're connecting to. We're going across that software-defined network. And again, this is just like you build your network, you hit play, and it builds this network of devices. And this matches that same physical network that I talked about earlier. We're connecting to that remote S1 station in this environment, right? So we're connecting to that remote station, and we can see that we're sensing the environmental values. So that's that simulated sense hat that we can actually see that we're sensing those values in this environment. And we're making those become accessible on certain TCP ports that we're connecting in through. And that's what this is showing now. Uh, we're also, in this case, the way it's read, it's, it's read as a Celsius value. We can convert it, right, using algorithms to change it to become uh, a uh, Fahrenheit value. We can change it any way that we want, you know, in this environment. And that's where it's really, really important to understand the algorithm that's operating the environment, right? An adversary wants to change the way our inputs and our outputs are connected, right? So just imagine in, a, in your home, what if your thermostat was compromised and, and somebody changed the, the temperature that it turns on, right? All they have to do is change that sense value or change your configuration of, of hey, I want it to turn on at 60 degrees or 80 degrees or 70 degrees. Those are set points. And that is a control system, right? Your, that's your front end, though. That's your man-to-machine interface, that thermostat that's connected to the HVAC system in your home. And so here we are just looking at the dashboard, and we're going through. We're still going back and forth, and we're changing the actual value. Since we have an emulated sense hat, if I want to change the temperature or the barometric pressure or the humidity, boom, I just go and change it. And then it's changing on the dashboard as we're actually making changes to those sensors. In real world, we'd have a real sense hat. And to change those values on a real sense hat, I would have to change the environment or maybe shoot it with a laser, right? Or maybe somehow induce something, change the electrons, change the data flow. Uh, or another lab that we have actually gets in the middle of the network flow and changes the data while it's going across the comm channel. What if it goes across an RF channel? What if it goes across a network cable? What if it goes across multiple hops? What if it's stored in a database before it gets to the actual HMI, the dashboard? And then what kind of decisions are made based upon that data that's being transmitted and received? Here we're looking at some of the HMI configuration. So you can see that actual chart and how it's built or the gauge and how it's built on the dashboard. So again, the way Node-RED works, and you create your HMI, it's all in the same space, right? We create our HMI and we create our functional flow logic to be able to connect our inputs or outputs. Now here we're just reading. We're not actually making any decisions based on what we're sensing in the environment. We're just displaying on a dashboard what we're reading. And this would be no different than uh, your car, right? Your car gives you information about the speed that you're going, and then you have an accelerator that you make the decision the speed that it goes. Now we go to more automated cars, well then that starts getting connected together, or you just turn on cruise control, right? So cruise control in a car is a, uh, a special type of a PID loop, proportional integral derivative uh, loop. That's a little bit more advanced topic. We don't have a mission car on that right now, but you can write that down what a, a PID loop is. So we just completed step one. 
that showed our architecture. So let's take a look at step two. What step two is going to do is start making adjustments in the algorithm. It's actually going to make a change how the algorithm is constructed. If somebody makes adjustments or figures out an algorithm of a control environment, that's where there can be maliciousness, right? They start understanding how the operator display works with, let's say, influencing the algorithm for water treatment. That's part of the Oldsmar plant hack, right? That happened in Florida earlier this year. They looked at changing how much lye was being added. And then this gets into a little bit of more your chemical engineer of looking at, well, what does that do? How does that impact the pH, right? What does that do to a facilities or communities, municipality water supply in an environment? So here we now have our HMI up. We're seeing these values that we're reading from the environment. And we're actually gonna go in and change the algorithm that's running on the other side. We're gonna make an adjustment to that once that step uh, continues. So again, um, another thing to connect here as dots, I mean, this is how potentially the individual there at Oldsmar plant felt as they were being compromised. I mean, literally the mouse is going across the screen, things are changing, and that's, they caught it. It ended up being a little bit more of a novice hack. It was a username and password vulnerability that was taken advantage of, uh, but then they were able to stop it before it really truly had an impact. What if it was a little bit further along? What if truly the OT environment, that operational technology, industrial control system technology environment, maybe that trickled a little bit further into that process and truly impacted it? That's what we want to stop. We don't want it to get that far in the environment. And that's how we have to be able to model, understand, uh, and respond to things before they truly impact it. So here, uh, we just went in and we made that adjustment. We actually changed, we're looking at change the configuration. Uh, so that the incorrect values are now going to show up on that operator dashboard. So take a look here. We're going to just change that code. We're going to comment out the old code and change it. And this is just that nine fifths, five ninths, changing things from Celsius to Fahrenheit. And how little of a change all of a sudden can lead to incorrect information being conveyed and a changing of that algorithm, how it could then change the decisions we're making in an environment, especially if they're automated. So that's where it's really important for the logic that we operate in these systems for us to have what's called a fingerprint or a checksum, something to validate if anything has changed in one of these environments. So, you know, that, that logic is really important to have backups of. You know, we, there's one thing to be concerned about things like ransomware impacting an environment and then responding to it. But we also have to make sure that we have valid backups of an environment all the way down to these embedded devices like logic controllers or sensors and actuators so that anything is adjusted, we can confirm our past configuration with our current configuration to see if anything has changed. All right, so that's what that was. That was going through and making the change and you can actually see uh, those values were, were adjusted. So the next part here is we're going to actually look at that data flow being captured with Wireshark. That's that final piece. Uh, and that's what step three is. So let's take a look at step three. So we opened up Wireshark when we first lost this mission. Uh, now we're gonna actually see inside that payload. And again, remember, as I was commenting earlier, we're not using Mobbus, which is again, is a common industrial protocol. We're not using Allen Bradley PCC, S7, all these protocols. We're just putting it directly in the data payload. Now, could we? Yes. Uh, and in fact, our palette there on the left-hand side of Node Red, it has those modules in it to talk those industrial protocols. So we can model really any of these different types of environments, uh, but it really just increases some of the complexity for the introductory missions we're trying to go through right now. So we're gonna take a look. We're actually gonna see again that HMI that's built out. So that's what it's showing. It's just showing again that pressure value, the, the, uh, the gauge. And now we're taking a look at the um, another one of the uh, of the charts. And now we're going to go and look at the other side uh, of this in just a moment. So there's our HMI. We can see we're reading all the values correctly. So we're looking at that pressure. That's what that first click was there. We're seeing a thousand. And now we're going to take a look at what we're capturing inside of Wireshark. Now, we do have a filter enabled. That's what's up there in that green indicator, the very top of the bar. There's a filter enabled only looking at very specific uh, ports. And so that's what that just highlighted on its own there. And, and you can then see inside that payload, we had that value 1,000. And so it just highlighted. So that's what we're capturing on the network. 
we can actually see those network streams going across. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to, since it's an emulated synset, we're going to change the value. We're going to go in and we're going to change that value to be something else. So now we're starting to change that value to leave that thousand number to go down to, let's say, 900. But we could change to whatever we wanted to. But what we should see is as we're reading it on that port number, we should see that value change within the comm channel. Now, where this matters is in a later mission, we actually do a man in the middle attack and we change that value. Why we make it show an incorrect value. So you can see now that matches up with what we actually set. So now Wireshark is showing the correct value. Again, this is a live capture. You know, this is truly running on a Raspberry Pi right now that we're interacting with um, out on the internet as we're doing this. And so this is not a, a video that we're going through. That's a live network capture there. It's just controlling, you know, the steps control the mouse clicks as we're going through it. And so that step's all completed. Let's go ahead and log out of this station. And we have a, a few minutes left. Again, feel free to ask questions. The last mission that I want to go through uh, with you is going to be the remote sensors man in the middle attack. Again, I encourage you to take the time to go through our Twitch channel stations. They're all sitting there for you to interact with, uh, even after this session, right? So again, pod one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then eight, the, uh, the laser are all sitting there for you to interact with them uh, right now. Uh, another really good mission, well, they're all good mission cards, but another one is understanding state machines, right? The concept of a state machine. And so we use the traffic light model to do that. So we're going to go into mission six. So let's go ahead and log in. We'll see if we've gotten over that one minute hurdle uh, that we needed to get over. No, nope. got to wait a second. So let's go ahead and go to, uh, let's hop out of this pod and we'll go to pod two, unless somebody else is already in there or pod. What pod are we going to go to? Pod four. All right, so let's go ahead and log in. And we're going to do mission six, mission six. And you can go ahead and open up the mission card here as this loads in. And you'll see, you know, once you start getting into these pods, we encourage you to start with mission zero. Mission zero explains the environment as well, in quite a bit of detail. But so does that twitch.tv slash cybodyworks underscore pods channel. There's a live view of me. Uh, I didn't duplicate myself, but I am out there <laughs> on repeat talking about this specific environment and how it's set up, the architecture. Uh, a question came in is how long will these pods be available? Uh, we've committed to having them up all tomorrow as well. Uh, we try to keep them up on an ongoing basis. So they've been up for the past week. So if there's anything, you know, if you have any questions, you can, again, follow our Cybody Works channel that we have, the one you're on right now, and you can interact with us. And in fact, even tomorrow, there's going to be another Twitch talk that we're doing around open source tools that's going to be on this channel. So there's, there's all sorts of ways you can connect with us, but these pods should be up on an ongoing basis uh, for you to be able to interact with them. So now we're going to do a remote sensors man in the middle attack. And so now we went through looking at the architecture of the sense hat, seeing the data flow, getting in, looking at the Wireshark uh, transmission. Now, how could somebody actually manipulate, not at the sensor, not at the HMI configuration, not at the algorithm, which you've already seen, but within the network itself, could they make adjustments? And that's where it becomes important to do integrity checks, diversity of sensors uh, within an environment. So let's go ahead. And what we're going to do is do, take a look at step one uh, in, uh, back on that pod. So we've architected our environment. It's all up and running. And we're going to run uh, step one here. All right. So what step one is going to do is show us our current gauges that we have. It's going to go back and show us a bit of the same environment that we're already looking at, but give us a good view of it. Um, it also is showing that ARP table there, the MAC address of actually station one. Because what this TAC is going to do, it's an old school attack. It's been around for quite a while of doing ARP spoofing. Now, it requires you to be somewhere in the middle of your network. Hey, that's awesome. Great. This, uh, I, I, somebody just commented on uh, taking my class back at DePaul University. So yeah, we've been doing this for a while, right? <laughs> There's server dude, 1976. So yeah. What's between the source and destination? Here's, there's, there's a good comment there as we're looking at what this is describing. I'm always trying to follow the data. The question is, how did it get there, right? It, it came from, let's just look at your car. It came from the valve stem of your tire 
and it showed up on your dashboard. Ask the questions, how to get there, what communication line, what printed circuit boards, what chips, what data flow, how did it get between those different points? And that's, that's ultimately what we're trying to then figure out. The adversary wants to figure it out and we want to stop the adversary from being able to impact it at each one of those trusted points from the valve stem to the dashboard. And then what else, when you start looking at that pathway, what else touches that pathway? What else has trust along that pathway? Now, in this example, if you ever see on your HMI, enable an HMI man in the middle attack, that little button there on the left-hand side, you, you probably want to stop things right away. That's, that's interesting. That would be a, a, bad, a bad story right, as you're getting into that. Um, so let's go ahead. We just finished looking at step one. Let's take a look at step two. So what step two is going to do is it's going to now take a look at the actual attack that's going to take place. And, and the attacker comes in and gets in the middle at the remote side. It actually spoofs the default gateway of the S1 receiving station that's there. So here's some of the code that we're looking at. It uses header cap, it goes in the middle, and then it even changes uh, some of the GPIO pins on the traffic light board. But we're gonna stay focused just on that data flow itself and being manipulated. I know we gotta wrap up here in just a moment. So I wanna go ahead and try to uh, get to step three when, we're, when that's available. It's not available yet. We gotta wait for step two to finish up. Uh, but here's what it's going to do. It's trying to highlight how it's going to change those specific values. So it's gonna go in and change the values of this environment to not be what's actually being sensed on that sense head. It's going to change them to these specific values using what's called an editor filter in this environment. All right, again, it's gonna go across our software defined network. So we're gonna be able to see that. It's gonna spoof that router's MAC address. So now we can type step three. And what you're gonna watch is when this attack occurs, you're gonna see that MAC address in that ARP entry there change. It's no longer gonna be the correct MAC address anymore. And so it just highlighted it. And we're also gonna see that enter cap attack slide across here. So, and you're gonna see that HMI value change. So I'm gonna let it start the attack. It does end it but we're running uh, short uh, or almost close to the end of a time. So once it does the attack, uh, I'll then tell you what happens is at the end of it, it spoofs back the correct MAC address so that everything works again. Everything starts working correctly after it's made the changes. It also shows in this demonstration, after the values change, as we try to change the sense hat, it no longer shows the correct values uh, any longer uh, in that environment. All right, so I encourage you to take a look at the mission stations. I'm going to hand things back over to Amanda just for a moment to summarize things up. And I hope you enjoyed our session and uh, learning about industrial control systems. And hopefully you'll enjoy the mission cards as you get a chance to work with them. Thanks, Matt. Um, and thank you to being a part of our third one here. I know you. we work with you regularly, so I appreciate you guys taking the time today to, to work on this tonight with us. Um, thank you all for joining tonight. Um, for those of you that will be watching this on the replay, um, it will get posted on the Cyberforce website um, in the next week um, or so. And then uh, stay tuned for July. July 14th is our next Cyberforce webinar. Um, and that will be geared towards the National Initiative on Cybersecurity Education Program. So the NICE program um, will be having their program manager talk to us about what they're looking at doing um, from students to employers to education uh, type changes. So stay tuned. Thank you again for coming. And I hope you guys all have a really great night. Thank you. Mm -hmm.